Hi everybody, welcome to this Board Game Life episode number 29, titled Falling for Games. This episode was recorded on November 18th, 2013. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of this board game life. So good to have you back and uh, listening here. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a change. Um, that, well, not a huge change, but a little bit of a change in how I'm going to be doing the shows. So it's hopefully, hopefully, going to really help me out. Uh, and I guess also as a side benefit, it's going to be good for all you listeners as well. And uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for quite some time, where I'm going to make some. A little bit of like a smaller show, but that's going to enable me to put them out a little more frequently or not frequently, but on a more regular schedule is uh, one thing that I've been running into for uh, quite some time now is that scheduling, we're well, not really scheduling, but organizing the show and sorting out exactly what I'm going to talk about and making notes and so forth. It's really kind of a daunting task. And I'll start it and then I'll always find something else to do. And it uh, kind of never gets done, uh, at least in a timely fashion. So I really believe that if I shorten things up a little bit, it'll help me produce the content and it'll get it out to you guys uh, a lot quicker. And also, this is going to be my first attempt at a minimally edited show. So it's going to have probably a lot of flubs, a lot of uh, what do they call them, verbal crutches or whatnot. Those are things like ums, ahs, like, who knows what else. I've probably done it a million times already, but sorry. <laughs> that's just how I talk. I guess that's how most people talk, but you might not notice it. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to minimally edit it because editing is so, so time consuming on our sister show, this Xbox life, which I also co-host when we first started that show back in 2008, we used to edit the show like crazy. If it was an hour long show, we probably spent three hours editing it. Granted how we recorded it. We had uh, four hosts at the time, made it a little bit difficult and we would just go through, you know, if somebody coughed, it would get edited out. Ums, ahs, background noises. And you do all this like, different um, processing and, and so forth of the audio to make it sound clean, remove. It's, it's just so much work that it's so easy to get burned out. And that's uh, from what I've heard. That's something that is very common with podcasters where you just spend so much time doing this kind of stuff that it just annihilates you. And we kind of did a lot of that in the beginning of this board game life as well. And uh, I, I I would probably say that it might be one of the reasons why Jeff kind of got burned out on this and maybe even the hobby altogether, just uh, the amount of time that's spent on it. So you've got the uh, unedited Rob from this point out, at least uh, as much as as we can uh, allow for here. But so uh, let's uh, let's kind of get on with the show over here. So uh, for this show, we're going to talk about a couple of things here. I'm going to try to keep it, uh, I'll say too light, but I just want to go over a bunch of games that I really want to discuss, uh, that I've been playing over the past couple of weeks and months. So we're going to talk about Amerigo, uh, from Queen Games. Castaways is, uh, another game that, uh, I've been really enjoying. Then there's Infection, Humanity's Last Gasp. We're going to have Downfall of Pompeii, Pixel Tactics 2, and followed up by a little bit of an Essen rundown, where I'll just talk about some games uh, that were released in Essen a couple weeks ago. Uh, then kind of a new segment that I thought would be fun, at least to give it a shot. Uh, we'll see how it works out, if it's going to return in the future. It's a segment called 20 Shows Ago, where we go back 20 shows, and I kind of give a... I don't know if it's a it's a rundown, but just I'll, I'll talk about the games that we talked about back then, 20 shows ago, and kind of give uh, an updated opinion or so. So being that this is a 29th show, I'll talk about the ninth show, uh, which uh, aired uh, earlier part of last year, about 18 months ago or so. 
And um, yeah, so that's about the the main things that we're going to be talking about. Um, also want to mention that uh, the YouTube channel uh, is doing pretty well. I'm, I'm really pleased with that. So um, if you, this is the first time you've been listening to the show, I also started uh, this Board Game Life YouTube channel. There's been, uh, I don't know, about a little bit over a dozen videos posted over there. A little bit of everything. There's some, like, uh, unboxings. There's some really in-depth reviews out there where uh, I've gone through and kind of played the f- a couple of turns of the games, really explained how to set it, how set, how to set the games up and how to play and so forth. So uh, that'll probably be evolving as time goes by, but I'm really excited about it. I'm really pleased with how it's been turning out so far. Uh, I've also um, done a whole bunch of videos for Miniature Market as well. Uh, Miniature Market is an online retailer here, and they also have a retail storefront, but uh, they're an online retailer here in the United States, uh, one of the top retailers, I I believe, in the country, and uh, my favorite retailer, actually. So I've done about uh, 20 unboxing videos for them. There's uh, some more that are still in the pipe that haven't been released yet, but... uh, look for more of those as well. And those videos are on their uh, YouTube channel. And then uh, also uh, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So that's uh, youtube.com slash this board game life. If you subscribe, you'll be notified when I put new videos out there. And then uh, also, of course, um, I'm trying to be active on Twitter. Uh, The Twitter group name or host or whatever it is, is at T board game life. So definitely definitely do check that out as well and uh, become a follower. So, okay, let's get on with the game. So the first game that I want to talk about is Amerigo. Now, this game was a Kickstarter game. I believe it was Kickstarted earlier this year in 2013. So it was released in 2013 uh, by Queen Games. It's a Stefan Feld game. So if you're a Stefan Feld fan, um, if you like Stefan Feld's games, or I guess a Stefan Feld fan, then uh, I'm sure you're aware of this game, and there's a lot of people that love his games. Uh, it's a game for two to four players, and it plays in about 90 minutes or so. Uh, it's probably pretty accurate. Maybe bump that up a little bit more if you have a, a full complement of players. And the ages are 10 and up. Uh, this is one also that I've done uh, uh, two videos on, so uh, if you're interested, definitely check those out my YouTube channel. So uh, basically what, what kind of game is this? Well, uh, it's a, it's a board game of course, uh, that has a ton of components. Uh, Basically what you're doing in this game is to, you're going through as uh, you're helping Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, That was one of the, if you remember your history, uh, that was uh, one of the, uh, Discovery guys, uh, one of the explorers uh, back in the day. So you're helping Amerigo Vespucci on his journey to discover new land. And uh, you're going through the islands of South America. You're trying to um, build settlements and, uh, I guess, score the most points, of course. Isn't that kind of like the, the standard in most games? So looking at the components of this game, wow, 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 wow. The box is huge. So it is an extremely large box. Um, oh, it's not probably the biggest box ever, but it's definitely one of the biggest boxes I have. It's pretty close to one of the big box games um, boxes, like you know Carcassonne and Alhambra and who knows what else they have out there. So it's a fairly large box. Uh, I weighed it when I got it. It was uh, six pounds. That is a heavy game. There's a lot of stuff in there. The quality of the components is fantastic. They use just great quality components. Uh, Everything punched out really nicely. Uh, Actually, when I was filming one of the videos, I was really concerned as I was moving the sheets around. I thought that everything would kind of fall out. But for the most part, everything stayed in. And it's also a really weird layout where... It was a very large sheet that was basically folded uh, twice. So instead of having box-sized sheets or whatever they call them, sprues or whatnot, 
it was basically a much larger sheet that they you know, kind of sliced and folded twice. So uh, basically, uh, you have more sheet to punch out than the size of the box, I guess. Um, the insert, the insert is amazing. Uh, it is one of the nicest inserts that I've seen in a really long time, and I'd probably say it almost is a little bit better than the Lords of Waterdeep one just because things fit in it a little bit nicer. There's a lot of room for the different components. And uh, if you haven't heard, there's a cube tower in this game, and the cube tower fits very nicely. You disassemble it and, uh, into a couple of parts. Uh, there's like a hopper that goes in the top. There's the uh, cube tower itself and the base that collects everything. Those all uh, come apart, and they fit in their own little spots, uh, which is really neat. So. The insert and, and the storage of the game is, is definitely top-notch. Uh, they've definitely set the bar as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the rules are, you know, done pretty well. It's a, it's a nice sheet that has a lot of examples, uh, you know, typical queen fashion. It's the production on it. It's really nice. Uh, a lot of really good examples. And the artwork in the game is really well, well done also as well. Uh, it's got a very much of a uh there's a game back in the day called Seven Wonders or no not Seven Wonders Seven Cities of Gold Seven Wonders is is a much newer game of course so Seven Cities of Gold and it, this the art style really reminds me of that game so if any of you have you know done any uh, gaming back in the PC era I don't know about 20 plus years ago you might remember that game from Electronic Arts but uh the art style on it is really nice as well. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and, uh, I don't know, the last part of the components uh, would be that just they've really set the bar all together across the board with this. I, I really like it. Uh, the rules book, this thing is really well laid out. It's about 12 pages altogether. It has a lot of examples in there and uh, very colorful um, I don't know what else I can say. It's 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 straightforward read. It's not one of those complicated rule books, and uh, good stuff definitely. So gameplay on this thing. Uh, the goal of the game is, of course, to score the most victory points. You know, of course, that really doesn't tell you much, now does it? But that that is the goal. There's a couple of different um, areas of play in this game. So you've got these tiles where you lay them out and they form islands surrounded by water. And these islands, I'm sorry, these tiles vary depending on the amount of players. So you'll use nine tiles for a, a two-player game. So it's a three-by-three three grid. And then you go three-by-four grid for three players and, of course, four-by-four four for four players. So the four-player map is, is quite large. So you set this thing up and you have these ships, your ships, then as part of your, your gameplay, they will go from islands to island and you'll build settlements. Once you build settlements, you can start effectively colonizing that island. And when you colonize, you have these little Tetris like pieces that match squares on, on the islands and you have these Tetris-like pieces, and you're trying to fit these pieces on the island. So when you put them down an island, you have two goals. One is possibly to fill up the island. When you fill up the island, you score a, a lot of points. And then also, as you're filling up the island, there's various resources, or they call them commodities, within the game. Uh, there's various resources on the island, such as cotton and coconuts, coffee, and a couple of the two other things. So you're trying to pick these up as well. And then at the end of the game, these things also score you points. So that mechanic was actually, uh, was actually pretty neat. I, I really thought that, uh, that added a fun little element where you're essentially exploring the different islands and, and you're getting your, um, you're getting your exploration out into the different shaped islands and sometimes it's a little bit of a, a little bit of chore to f not chore but it's a it's a little bit of a challenge 
to complete an island just because of how it's laid out and, and then the Tetris-like pieces that you have. The other component of this game is the cube tower. Now, this is something that is, it's gotten a little bit of, mm, there's been a bunch of discussion on this thing on BGG, uh, basically people wondering if it was very effective. And what I mean by that is that you have seven different colored uh, cubes and, and multiples of each. It's seven of each color. So seven times seven is 49 cubes. And as throughout the game, what you do is you drop these cubes into this tower, um, usually up to seven cubes at a time. Certain cubes will get caught in the cube tower. There's two platforms in there that have a number of holes in them. So the cubes might fall on one of the little uh, like barrier pieces and they'll sit in there. And then next time that you dump cubes in there, they might get knocked out and come out the bottom and others will get stuck. So the discussion on BGG about this thing is that the cube tower essentially will dump out everything you dump into it. And it doesn't give you enough variation. So if you dump in seven cubes, you'll probably get seven cubes out. And the way that the game works is that as you dump these cubes out, each colored cube type is a different action. Like one might be a pirate action or a move your ship action and, and so forth. So it kind of relies on having multiple colors come out in, of the uh, cube tower. Well, there are people that were having issues with this where when you dump the cubes in there, you, that's all that you get out. So if you dump black cubes, which is a pirate action or a, a cannon action to fight off pirates, uh, if you dump the black cubes in there, you dump five in, you get five out, and then everybody has to do the same action, which is the, the cannon action. Now, every time I've played this thing, I've actually had what I thought was a satisfactory result where let's say you dump the black cubes in, you get uh, a bunch of black cubes out, which is, um, I think, to be expected because the black cubes are what basically has like the velocity going through the cube tower, and they'll knock out maybe like one or two other colors as well. So it gives you a little bit of variation, and then the fact that you're dumping in that main color that time, that gives you the quantity and well, I guess I should probably explain that. So if you dump a certain color in there, uh, and then let's say you get uh, five black cubes out, a white and two yellows, what you basically do is you count all the cubes that came out of the tower and uh, of each particular color, and then the color that there's the most of, that's the amount of action points that you have. So if let's say if there were five black cubes that came out, uh, one white and two yellow, you have five action points available to you of either black, white, or yellow actions. So, and with that being said, I, I think that it works just fine if there isn't a huge spread, um, because what I think some people are, are looking to get from this thing is that you dump in your five cubes, let's say, and then you get like two black two green and two whites. That's, I don't think that makes for a very exciting game because your quantity now is two action points of those three colors. And that I don't, I think it's better to have a lot more of one color and then a couple of the other ones. And so based on my experiences and other people might have different experiences based on how they throw the cubes in there or even the construction of their cube tower. Um, yeah, they, they might have, uh, you know, different experiences. And um, I don't know, I would think that they might have to adjust. <laughs> they would have to adjust how they drop everything in there to uh, change their experience. But anyway, now that I've gone off on that huge tangent, uh, let me try to get back to uh, where it was in this game. So, um yeah, I, I talked about the rules book and the components a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, we got the goal of the game. And so you're looking to colonize the islands and uh, gather the resources, or as they call them, the uh, commodities uh, that are uh, out on the islands that are kind of distributed. 
not at random, but there's spots on the board where you, you find them. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's probably like the, the two key elements of, of the game. Uh, everybody also has their own player board, uh, that has a couple of tracks on there. There's a gold track, a cannon track. There's a, uh, what do they call it? A, um, productivity track or something like that. I believe, uh, production track. No, I think it was productivity. Anyway, that whatever it's called. So what that track does is it, uh, kind of spirals around and, uh, it lets you get special, I call them abilities, uh, within the game. Uh, basically it'll let you kind of modify the rules of the game. So for example, um, you might get some extra actions when there's a certain color involved or when there's pirates attack, uh, everybody else has uh, a too higher value to, um, to, to fend off. So, uh, that's a progress token. And one thing about this game also is some components of that pro of that, uh, player board. They really remind me of the game Peloponnese, which is a fantastic game came out a couple of years ago. So I guess all in all, this game reminds me of a couple of things, seven, uh, cities of gold, Peloponnese and Tetris. So that's, it's a, it's a decent combination. Um, so, uh, you know, moving forward back to the game, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to pick up, uh, once you're kind of guided through a couple of turns, um, the, you know, pros for this game. Uh, I really enjoyed it partially, I think because of the nostalgia of those other games. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities and stuff that you can do, which is something that is very common for Stefan Feld games. So you look at the game Luna, if you're familiar with that, it's just so many things you can do. Uh, same thing with, you know, Castles of Burgundy. This is no different. Uh, I guess that also is a, is a con to the game where because there's so many things you can do, so many different actions that you can do, it can be difficult in the beginning when you're first learning how to play the game. It can be a little bit difficult for you to figure out what to do because there's no clear goal. Um, you know, the game's not linear, which is a, it's just a good thing, but there's no clear goal and you kind of find yourself trying different things. Well, at least that was my experience the first time I played well, let me try this and see what happens. Let me try that, see what happens. And you kind of have to weigh a little bit on, you know, what do I do? Do I explore the island? Do I do my cannons? And and after a couple of games, you kind of, you know, kind of get into the groove with this game because you learn what you need to do when. Uh, for example, you know, do your cannon action early on because, um, you know, later on you'll just get walloped by the pirates if, if you don't because you might not have the option to do it later. So that's just a quick example. Um, I guess another con to the game is uh, table space. This game takes up a ton, an absolute ton of table space. When you take into account just the size of the map tiles and how, how big the map is and all the player boards and so forth, it really does take up a lot of space. So you just have to have a big size table. I initially tried to do my video and, and everything and my game learning on a little card table, and that is barely enough uh, to uh, to lay the game out. So you need a, a fairly big size table. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it for the cons. So my final thoughts on the game is uh, I, I really enjoy the game. It's uh Another uh, winner of a game from Feld. It's got a lot of different uh, mechanisms in there, a lot of options for the players. I would definitely recommend this to um, just about anybody. Uh, it's definitely not a, a gateway game or an entry-level game. Just because of the amount of options that you have, it'll just bring the entry-level person kind of to their knees. They just won't know what to do with kind of the kind of like the, the lack of a clear goal type of mechanism, very common to Feld games. Um, so, um, and replayability, I, I'd say it's uh, fairly replayable. I don't know if it's got the staying power, but 
uh, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a winner. So then the next game that I want to talk about is Castaways. So this was a game that was also released this year in 2013. It's uh, released in the United States by uh, Passport Game Studios. Uh, the designer is Alberto Corral. It's, it plays one to four players in uh, two or more hours, um, usually or more. Uh, I don't I would probably say it's a two-hour game even for a solo play if you play it by yourself. It just takes a long, long time to play this game. Not that that's a bad thing. Uh, it's meant for 14 and up age-wise, and this game is a semi-cooperative game. So uh, I guess I should probably explain that a little bit. So semi-cooperative basically is that everybody's working together uh, for a common goal, but in the end, someone is a winner. And in this game, everybody is working to get off an island than the person that has the most story points, which is the game's version of victory points. They're the one that, uh, that win. Uh, I did do some videos on this one as well. Uh, I really thought that the instruction manual was uh, kind of hard to understand in particular with the setup. I, I really had a hard time with the setup, just making sense of of the, uh, of the, I guess, translation or the language in the book. Uh, I guess it's maybe not translated optimally, or at least it doesn't explain it well in English. I don't know if in, uh, if it's an original format, if it's any better, but, uh, I really wanted to help people out to kind of like learn how to set the game up and, and how to play. So I actually did two videos. One is a setup video, which, uh, spent, uh, uh, quite a bit of time just explaining how to set up the cards and there was a lot of stuff that was very unclear to me so I wanted to help people out with that and then I also went over a little bit of gameplay and kind of show the different parts of the game so um, you know w what kind of game is this in case you haven't heard of it or haven't seen anything about it at all so um, this is a it's a, a board and card game where it's kind of like in the style of Robinson Crusoe uh, from Portal, uh, where you're shipwrecked on an island and you and your fellow um, shipwreckies or whatever you want to call them uh, are basically working to get off of the island. You're trying to survive on the island, explore the island, uh, reach the innermost heart of the island, uh, basically getting up to kind of like the top of a mountain, and then uh, using some resources to signal a passing ship to come and rescue you. So basically that's kind of like the the gist of the game. Um, you know, I, I love to go over the components in the game, so that's coming up next right here. So the box is a, a typical sized box. Uh, you know, nothing really out of the ordinary, I guess, like similar sizes, you know, maybe like Ticket to Ride, fan, Fantasy Flight games and so forth. Uh, the bits in there, uh, they're all plastic pieces, uh, which is, uh, I guess, good or bad, depending on what you prefer. Uh, the plastic pieces come in uh, cube form. There's these little things that are food. They look like chicken legs to me, uh, like uh, the type that you eat, <laughs> the chicken drumsticks. Uh, and then uh, wood and uh, like wood representations and uh, and so forth. So uh, some people don't like the plastic, some do. Uh, I guess that depends on your taste. Uh, everything punched out fairly nicely. There's a lot of tiles in there. Everything came out pretty clean. Um, as far as storage and insert and stuff in the game, I, it's just a, a typical cardboard insert, nothing special. Uh, I just basically laid mine flat so I could fit everything in there. So once you put everything in there, it's just a bunch of stuff in a box. <laughs> That's the kind of insert style. Bunch of stuff in a box. Uh, the rules in the game, um, it's, I, I kind of struggle with these rules uh, in, a, in a couple of fashions. Number one is uh, I struggle with the rules because they were just kind of hard to understand. Uh, I've got an engineering background, so maybe I just read too much into it and and I, I try to second guess, like, what do they mean, this or that or so forth? But I really think with these rules, everything is in that rule book. However, the way that it's taught just really 
I guess, isn't optimal, at least for my learning style. But with that said, everything's in there. So if you know the rules, and I've said this before, if you know the rules well, you go through the rule book and it makes perfect sense. So I can see why the rules wound up this way. But even the setup was kind of confusing and what the different cards were. And again, this could be just me and, and how my how I interpreted the rules. But uh, yeah, so the rules are very confusing. Uh, the artwork in the game is, is pretty nice. I, I like the style. It really helps with, uh, you know, convey the theme of shipwrecked on an island, you know, um, from a galleon or whatever they call those wooden ships, the big wooden ships. Uh, it just, it's, it's got the perfect look for that time frame, And, uh, I really like the art. Um, the rules book again is kind of a tough read, uh, just because, uh, just the way that it's laid out. Uh, but they do have some examples of play in there that kind of do help convey things a little bit. All right. And how does this game play? Well, once you get everything figured out and sorted out, uh, hopefully somebody's leading you through the game uh, that'll cut uh, the gameplay time down quite a bit. Uh, what you do is you play through an event deck, which is a certain type of card that you have. And for each uh, round or turn in the game, whatever you want to call it, you flip one of those cards over and it triggers a couple of events. There's weather events and then shipwreck events and so forth. And when you first start the game, uh, the first event card will basically convey one thing to you in the game. This game wants to kick your butt. It is kind of a harsh game. You really, um, and maybe I shouldn't use the word harsh. It's a challenging game where you're really going to struggle to try to keep certain things uh, active within the game. And by those, I mean your health. Uh, there's two types of health that you have, I guess. Uh, there's injuries. And uh, there's also, I just forgot the name. I had to look it up real quick. Here. So there's injuries and there's traumas that you have on your little uh, uh, player card. You have a certain amount of spots for health and you get injuries where you put down white cubes and there are things that you can recover from by resting. And then there's traumas, which are permanent. So when you use your um, uh, rest ability, you can recover those injuries and and free that, uh, like that health back up. And then once you get those traumas, you're done. That spot is forever taken and you've reduced your player's ability. So a good part of this game, what you actually wind up doing is you're, you're kind of struggling to, to keep your injuries down and to not get the traumas. And there's a bunch of ways that you can get the traumas, um, basically by not taking care of yourself. So if you abuse your body, I guess, uh, that causes trauma, which is kind of like how it is in real life in, in some respects. So with, um, so with that said, you've got... Um, your health that you need to maintain. There's a campfire that you need to try to light. And then as a group, you got to maintain that campfire. If it extinguishes, then every player gets extra damage in the upkeep of the game towards the end. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff like this and, and, um, and so forth where you're really struggling. You're really struggling, hopefully as a group, because it's a co-op game. You're really struggling to keep things uh, going for the group, making sure you have enough food, making sure you have enough wood for the campfire and, and, and so forth. So, uh, you know, you learn early on that uh, the game is punishing, but that, that is a, a big part of what's fun about the game is that it is a challenge. It, it's not going to be a cakewalk uh, to play this game. I've found that when I kind of push my luck where I know that I should take care of something, but I might want to kind of push my luck, uh, wait till the next turn. You just, I just get walloped <laughs> and it's something that you can't recover from sometimes. So the one thing that I've really learned with this game is 
if there's something that you really need to take attention, you know, take care of that really requires your attention, do it because you'll pay the price uh, for that. Uh, I don't say later on, but usually pretty much immediately. So, uh, yeah, so there's a event deck that, that triggers different events. Um, and on the main board, uh, people will uh, place these uh, little, their little action guys and uh, you have a bunch of different options available to you. You can rest, you can uh, forage uh, to try to find food, you can write in your diary, which is a way to uh, score victory points, or as they call them, story points. Now, this is uh, there's a little bit of debate on the story points in this game, because if somebody is actively pursuing story points, uh, let's say while other people are trying to do uh, you know, gather wood and food and trying to explore, help gain, uh, get everybody off the island. You know, the person that's actively pursuing those story points, you know, yeah, they might win. You know, the other players are going to be working really hard to get everybody off the island. And again, everybody leaves the island together in order to win. And then the person with the most story points is the winner. Uh, if somebody is actively pursuing the story points, to me, that kind of is, uh, I don't know, not nice, <laughs> bad form. I'd I'd get kind of upset if somebody's just disregarding everything that everybody else is doing, not really pitching in and uh, just going after the story points. But you know, I guess that's some that's like the the bad guy that you see in some of those movies, like uh, those action movies where you got the guy who's like really mouthy and he's like uh, talking trash to the action star, and then you know. Ultimately, the guy somewhere in the movie meets an untimely end and everybody's like not too sad to see him go. But anyway, that's a kind of a jerky move that I think uh, is is bad form uh, to do. Because you know, to me, a, a cooperative game is cooperative. Everybody works towards a common goal. If you're not going to do that, why play? Just go play something else. But anyway... Uh, getting back to the game. So you've got all these different actions, uh, forage, story points. Um, you can uh, light a fire, which is actually pretty darn tough uh, to do. It, it's actually not very easy. Uh, there's a shipwreck uh, area where if there's a, a shipwreck uh, uh, item that's washed up from the shore, on the shore, you can go through and go through the shipwreck item or they call them, I believe, uh, resource cards. Uh, you can go through those and you can find items that will help you uh, in your um, pursuit of getting off the island. Like you might find a lighter or, or various things that give you food and, and so forth. So that is actually pretty important to search through. And uh, probably one of the, the biggest part of the game is to do an exploration action. And this is where you're exploring the different, uh, there's three different parts to the Island. There's the coast, the, uh, Oh, the name escapes me right now. There's, I believe it's like the interior and the heart. So you're exploring these different areas of the Island. And this is where the story comes through where there's 105 cards that you cycle through in these three different, um, three different areas where you draw these cards and they're a little randomized based on the setup of the game. You draw these cards and it gives you the the story. Essentially there's like little quests. And when you let, you know, might say something like, uh, you know, your, your players are experiencing, you know, this type of thing, you know, do you choose to explore or ignore? And if you explore, it might say add card numbers 72 and 85 uh, to this and that deck. So by going through this, you're actually growing your exploration decks and you're changing the way that you're experiencing the game. And then as you add these to the deck, you shuffle them up. So you really don't know how you're going to be experiencing them. So there is some replayability where each experience can be a little bit different. Uh, ultimately you're going to, if you play this often enough, you will run into the same cards over and over. So here's the chance for expansions. I've got 105 cards and I guess the sky's the limit as to how many they can add story wise. And on a side note, there are some people on BGG that already have some 
uh, fan cards, I guess, or, or fan plots that, uh, that they've uh, scripted out. So you can print these out and probably need to sleeve them and, uh, the rest of the cards. But, uh, you know, it, it, that gives you more options, of course. So, um, yeah, so there's a exploration thing, which is, uh, it's probably uh, very fun, and again, it's it is kind of punishing as well, because as you're exploring, the more you explore, the further you go, the harder it is for you to return to camp. And if you aren't able to return to camp um, sufficiently, and this is done by rolling a, a dice or a set of dice, so the further you you get, the the higher number you need to roll to. Uh, to, in order to get back to camp. Uh, if, if you don't do that, you get lost and you just get punished. Uh, this is where if everybody gets lost, your campfire goes out and you start accumulating damage and that gets pretty ugly. But, uh, you know, again, that's part of the appeal of the game because it's not easy and it is punishing. And you, you sit there, you know, that I shouldn't have chanced that last quests i should have just gone back because now i'm lost and this and then that happened so but live and learn so um basically um you know moving on real quick is um spending a lot of time in this on this game here uh the the game is um uh, fairly easy to pick up and uh it really helps to have an experienced player just because there's a lot of little rules to the game and uh, it really helps to have somebody explain them to you and at least keep you on track. And also on BG in the file section of this game, there's a couple of cheat sheets to kind of remind you of all the different upkeeps and different things that you need to do. So definitely check those out if you're going to be playing this game. So uh, stuff that I liked about this game is that it's extremely thematic. And when I was playing it, every time I played it, I really get a sense of kind of like uh, that old Tom Hanks movie, Castaway. You know, I'm stuck on an island with people and I've got that in my mind. It's like, oh, we need that campfire. And, we, you know, somebody's got to gather wood. You know, I'll go gather wood because I've got this ability. It's like, hey, we need some food and hey, let's go explore and so forth. So uh, the theme is just amazing i i really uh give the game props for for building and maintaining that theme throughout the uh throughout the game um stuff that i I didn't care about the game is i mean the rules i talked about that already a couple of times the the rules are just not written uh, ideally for for learning uh the play time can be a little long if you're going to be playing a solo game, kind of expect two hours or, or so. If you've got more players, easily uh, it can take a lot longer. I want to say we we had a three player game that took over three hours. Uh, but uh, one thing for me on that game is it it went quick. I, it really didn't seem like three hours, and I was actually kind of surprised that it took so long. And then another con is that if it's, you know, it's a semi-co-op game, so it's open to sabotage by other players that just don't want to play nice. And um, and I'm I'm of the mindset of, if somebody's going to play like that, I'm not going to be inviting him back. I just, I think that's just being a poor sport. So a quick rundown of the game. Uh, I I really enjoy this game. It's extremely thematic. I I really enjoy this style of game. And... uh, uh, I would recommend it um, if you like thematic games. If you're an analyzer or uh, somebody that just you know loves hardcore euros, uh, I don't know if I would consider this a mare trash. But if you're a hardcore gamer, I don't know if if the theme would work for you. Um, it's not ideal for those people that want to do the optimal rule. I don't know if there would really be any analysis paralysis in this game either, but uh, just uh, if you like theme, you'd probably like this game and uh, have a good time with it. If you like co-ops, you'd like it. But uh, otherwise, if you're just a hardcore, uh, you know, 
analyzer, you might want to stay away from it. It is replayable uh, to a point. Eventually, you'll learn all of the different cards in the game, all the different plots, quests, whatever you want to call them. But they are randomized, and uh, the way that they appear is different in every game. Uh, So every game won't be identical, and the circumstances won't be identical. There's so many variants to the game. Well, not variances in terms of like how you play, but there's so many different things that are randomized that when they come together, it should create a unique experience. And the fact that some people are doing their own cards for the game, that's a definite plus as well. So uh, hopefully they keep that up. And um, yeah, so that is Castaways. Again, uh, I give that one a definite thumbs up. Okay, the next game I want to talk about is a game called Infection, Humanity's Last Gasp. This is a game that came out this year from Victory Point Games. It was designed by John Gibson. It's a solo play game. You know, it plays in about 45 minutes to uh, probably an hour, uh, and it's for ages uh, 13 and up. also did a video on this one as well, uh, demonstrated uh, how to play the game, a couple of turns. Uh, definitely check that out. Uh, it's uh, quite a long video, about 40 minutes or so, uh, at least 40, 45 minutes. But uh, it's it's good stuff. I, I really uh, like how that video turned out. So uh, what kind of game is this? Um, this one is kind of hard for me to describe, I guess. It's a solo play game. It's got a, a board and puzzle type of element to it where you're, you're doing this like puzzle assembly. And, you know, it's not like puzzle pieces, but... You're, you're trying to put combinations of things together to, um, to solve something else, or in this case, to eliminate uh, something else. And I'll go into a little more detail on what I mean by that in, in a little bit here. Uh, basically, what you're doing in this game is uh, you're part of a uh, department, uh, I guess, of the government or some sort of agency where you're working... Uh, in New York City to cure a plague, basically, before it wipes out the human race. Well, I guess that's simple enough. Uh, basically, what do you get with this game? So, uh, it's a Victory Point game, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Victory Point. And this is one of their newer style games that comes in a box, and it also comes with uh, a mounted board. Or not a mounted board, but a... Uh, like a, one of their new puzzle piece boards where it's five pieces that come together and you have a, a little, uh, like a hard board as opposed to like a normal folded uh, paper board or a uh, cardstock board. Uh, so it's one of the newer style games that they have and the quality is uh, very, very good. I was pleasantly surprised by this game. Uh, just how the pieces are. I'm really starting to like the uh, victory point style of, of pieces where they have, um, I uh, guess the counters or chits or whatever you want to call them. They have a really nice sharp edge to them because they use a, a laser cutter to cut all of their pieces. So all of the pieces have a nice sharp edge to it as opposed to your typical stamped pieces where the top is a little bit rounded and then the bottom, of course, is a little more, um, it's got a little bit of a sharper edge on it. So uh, in addition to um, just having nice pieces like that, the pieces also can have some uh, interesting shapes as well. Uh, although in this game, they're all primarily uh, you know just circles and so forth. Uh, there are some uh, hexagons and and uh, squares with nice rounded corners as well. So uh, the quality of the pieces was was really good. I, I'm really uh, enjoying it. Uh, one thing that a lot of people talk about with Victory Point games is that uh, you get some soot on your hands from the laser uh, that burned the, uh, that cut the pieces out. Uh, with this game, I actually did not wipe the pieces down. Uh, they give you a little, it's like a little cocktail napkin, that they call wipes a lot. Uh, basically, they give it to you with the premise of, you know, you use it to wipe the soot off. And uh, I did that once with uh, Darkest Night, I believe. 
that was such a chore. I'm never doing it again. So I'll just play it with the pieces as they are. Any soot that comes off of your hands, big deal. It's it's really not bad. Some people uh, kind of make it out to be a little bit worse than it is. Maybe it was just their particular games that they had. Who knows? So, um, yeah, so the components are, are, are pretty neat. Uh, you get both a, uh, a puzzle piece board, which is uh, like the thick, uh, not cardstock or board, mounted board style quality board. But uh, so you get that and you get a folded sheet. A folded sheet I didn't really care for too much just because it doesn't lay perfectly flat. So that when you put pieces down, they kind of tend to move around or the board bounces around a little bit. Uh, initially, when I got my copy of the game, my uh, my mounted board was missing, but uh, Victory Point Games was uh, kind enough to send out a replacement, and uh, the replacement is awesome. I, I really like it much better than that than that board that I mentioned. Um, uh, punching out the pieces was a little bit difficult just because the pieces are held on by um, kind of like a, a thicker uh, region. So it requires just a little bit, bit more force to, to punch them out. I was concerned about it ripping a little bit, but I kind of found out that if I start the sheet, uh, the punch sheet at the end, and I kind of bend the punch sheet a little bit, they come out really nicely. So that, I guess that's my tip to you. If you get a victory point game, you might want to try to do that. Um the rules are, are pretty easy to read. The rule book is, is fairly nice. It, one thing that's different about the Victory Point uh, rule books is that the outside is a little bit of a thicker card stock, uh, and then the paper on the inside is uh, you know a little thinner, so it's got m- much more of like a book feel to it, which is kind of neat. So kudos to that. And the artwork on the game is, uh, is pretty nice. I, I like it. Uh, the pieces are basically the function of the pieces is conveyed really nicely by the art and uh, you know, good job in, in that as well. The rule book is pretty easy to read. Um, it's uh, how many pages is 20, 22 pages. So that's a fairly sizable rule book. And what I really like as well is that in the beginning of the rule book, the first couple of pages, they go through and they explain all the different pieces and they show you what the pieces are. And so many games you go through and you're looking at these pieces and these chits and counters and you're just wondering, what is this? You know, it's t- the rules are telling me to take the, uh, you know, this kind of component and put it over here on the board. I have no idea what that is. And you're trying to take guesses and, you know, checking the BGG and so forth, but not in this game. It's all laid out, uh, really nicely with, uh, with a lot of pictures of the, what the different components are. So, uh, uh, definitely give them props, uh, for that in the rule book. Um, so explanations in the rule book are, are pretty nice. There's some examples, which definitely do help as well. So, um, yeah, I, I give the rule book uh, a definite thumbs up. Uh, gameplay. Uh, this game is, is very, very interesting, where oh, basically what you're doing is, as I had mentioned earlier, you're looking to stop a plague uh, before the plague wipes out the human race. And you have that board in front of you that has a, a couple of different things. So... There's uh, one section towards the bottom that has proteins, which are kind of like your building blocks. Um, These uh, proteins will have different shapes on them. Some will have like a circle. Some will have like a circle with a triangle in it or a circle with a circle in it looking kind of like a donut. Uh, They're um, different colors as well to help you distinguish between them. But you're basically using these uh, protein tokens and you're trying to combine them on the right-hand side of the board, which is where you have antibodies. And uh, these antibodies are lettered uh, A through L. So there's um, 12 of them all together. If my math is correct here, yep, looks like 12. So there's uh, 12 of them all together. And uh, you put various combinations of these together and you build that antibody. On the left side, uh, it looks kind of like a Petri dish that contains 
uh, uh, a virus or a bacterium. And it depends on the uh, difficulty of the game. The easy one is the bacteria, and then the virus is, is the tough version of the game, and they're on different sides of the, the board. But uh, you have this thing on the in the Petri dish, and what you're basically looking to do is you use the antibodies that you have and you knock out the parts of the uh, of the virus or bacterium until hopefully at some point you eliminate the whole thing. And there's a couple of ways to finish the game. Of course, not all are you winning. You win by eliminating the virus or the bacteria, just basically by knocking out all the components with your antibodies. If, uh, if you don't accomplish that, the other ways to... Um, I don't say like uh, win the game, but in this case, it's lose the game is basically to run out of components or to, um, or you basically just uh, limit yourself. So you can't do anything more in the game or you essentially spread yourself too thin. Uh, You wind up losing the game. That's like if you run out of uh, proteins and so forth. So, uh, and then the other one is if, there's a uh, like a death track on the board as well. If that just gets too far advanced, of course, you lose the game as well. So um, yeah, I guess that's uh, kind of like a, a good gist of the game. So you're basically going through, you're collecting proteins to build antibodies to knock out uh, different uh, molecules or components of the bacteria or the virus. Uh the game is pretty easy to pick up. Um, it doesn't take too long to learn the game. The The rule book is, is laid out pretty well. Uh, one thing I did want to mention about this game is that um, it's, a, it's a fairly challenging game. It will kind of punish you. Uh, the virus or the bacteria can effectively mutate, uh, basically where stuff kind of gets shifted around, things get replaced. And, you know, you might have been looking to get a particular type of antibody to attack a particular section of let's say the bacteria but then hey the thing mutates and then all of a sudden everything that you've been working towards is uh kind of for naught so um yeah it it is uh it it is kind of a tough game but again you know that's what makes it uh makes it interesting if it was too easy you know if something's too easy you don't appreciate it so um the, the game uh, plays very smoothly as a solo game. Uh, I, I like how the, the box has got such a small footprint. Uh, there's so many games out there that have a lot of air in them. Uh, you know, this thing is uh, one of the smaller Victory Point games boxes, and it, it's it's full. It's It's got a lot of stuff in there, and uh, it's definitely easy to throw into a bag and, you know, take it to, uh, you know, wherever you're going. They're perfect for... A business trip you can play it on your hotel room uh you know fairly easily and uh, i do like the puzzle aspect basically of using proteins to build my antibodies you know, trying to figure out which ones i need and then putting them together and then attacking the um and attacking the different parts of the bacteria or the virus um i guess a con for the game the only thing i can really think of is actually two things. It is a solo game, so if you're not into solo games, hey, it's probably not for you. And uh, Victory Point games are a little tough to get into retail or to get from retail. Uh, usually you have to order them direct. Uh, and now these uh, these boxed ones, these boxed games, are finding their way into stores, into the distribution channels. So it's it's a little bit easier now than it was in the past. But other than that, I, I can't really uh, find any cons for the game. So uh, I definitely enjoyed this game. Uh, if you like solo games, uh, this is, uh, I think I feel it's like a must get. It's really enjoyable. I love it a lot. Uh, Victory Point Games has some really cool solo play games, and this is right up in there in that list of, of cool solo games that they have. Um, people that like solo games, again, those are the ones that this game is for. And uh, it, it is pretty replayable. There's uh, a lot of different... Uh, possibilities in this game of how things wind up of uh, I don't think I mentioned it but there's cards that are also in the game that kind of affect how things function like uh, you'll get different scientists cards that uh, 
are, are, are kind of interesting where people don't like to work with each other. It's, it's an interesting way to, um, have this mechanic where if you draw this scientist, they don't like that other scientist and, you know, then they don't want to do and do something. And it, it just, it, it's just an interesting, uh, personal relationship that they put into the game. But, um, yeah, so replayability on the thing is, is, uh, is pretty good just because it is challenging and, uh, you know, makes you want to try again to, to finish the game. Uh, the designer, John Gibson is, uh, I guess, working on an expansion to the game. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that game, to that expansion, and I hope it gets released. So, um, yeah, so that is Infection, Humanity's Last Gasp. And I definitely give that one a thumbs up. Then uh, uh, the next one that I want to talk about is a game called Downfall of Pompeii. I got this uh, one... Uh, from Miniature Market uh, to do a review on. And uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by this game. Uh, it's uh, Actually, let me give you the stats on it real quick. So this is a game that came out in 2013 by May- Mayfair Games, and it was a reprint that originally came out about 10 years prior. It was by Klaus uh, Jürgen Vrede. Uh, it plays two to four players, about 45 minutes or so, and uh, it's for ages 10 and up. And uh, this is a board game. Uh, it's a board game um, where uh, the gist of it is that uh, you've got the city of Pompeii and everybody knows, uh, hopefully, uh, the story of Pompeii where they basically got wiped out by a volcanic eruption. And um, there's two parts to the game. The uh, first half of the game, essentially, is you are going through and trying to get your people into Pompeii. Then the second half of the game you are trying to get your people out of Pompeii. Um, I don't know if that description gives the game, uh, it does the game justice, but uh, that's basically how it functions. So, uh, you know, basically let's go over the uh, the box and the components real quick. So um, what do you get? You get uh, a box, of course. Now, uh, Mayfair Games in uh, a couple of releases has had these like little flimsy boxes and, uh, Downfall of Pompeii definitely has that. It's just uh, extremely thin. Uh, it's a huge contrast to some of the Kickstarter games that have been coming out lately that have super thick boxes. This is like the opposite end of the scale. Uh, kind of like, you know, where you, it's, I don't say like it bows, you know, just because it doesn't have the support, it doesn't. it's not as thick. But, I mean, you apply a little bit of pressure, the thing definitely does flex. But... I mean, you're you're not looking at the box. Essentially, uh, you're really looking for the game. You know, how does the game play and so forth. And uh, you know, the, the game is is pretty solid. I, I enjoy it. So I can kind of get past the box, sort of. So uh, moving on to the pieces. I, again, nothing real special uh, with the pieces. Uh, they're you know just typical like wooden pieces. There is a volcano that you get, which is a really thick piece of plastic that you kind of uh, curve together and insert a tab into it, and it makes a like a partial cone, and that's a volcano, and it fits inside a hole in the main board. So you have your, on the board, you have your city of Pompeii, and you have the circle off in the corner, which is the big bad volcano that's uh, coming down to wipe everybody out. Uh, I do like the volcano. That thing is super sturdy. I don't think it's going to wear out anytime soon. And then the last thing I want to make a comment on is uh, there's cards and boards in the uh, board in the game, and the board is a little bit on the thin side, not horribly so, and the cards are just, they're also kind of on the thin side, but not horribly so. So um, uh, punching out, uh, there's some tiles that came with the game. Uh, they punched out uh, fairly nicely. Again, they're a little bit on the thin side, but uh, it doesn't really detract from the game. Uh, storing the game, it's just a whole bunch of stuff in the box. No real insert, no nothing. You just throw everything in there, and it just rattles around. Uh, the rules are very well done. Uh, I did think the, they did a great job on the rule book. Uh, it explains everything fairly well, and it's not a difficult game. Uh, it's pretty easy to pick up, so... Um, 
you know, you don't need a whole lot of rules for it. Artwork is decent. Uh, nothing special. It, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, one thing I did want to mention about the components is that the Mayfair version does come with a variant that includes a couple of extra tiles. And uh, the variant is okay. It just basically gives players an option of uh, what they want to do in the game. Uh, you get to choose uh, one of two things during the second phase of the game. And I'll uh, I'll talk about that in, the, in a second. So, uh, gameplay. Uh, there's two basic, uh, yeah, like two main phases in the game. I, I like to call them getting into Pompeii and getting out. Uh, what you do initially is uh, when you set up the game, you have a whole bunch of cards and there's a, a very specific way that you configure these cards and how you shuffle them together and, uh, and how you build the deck. So once you follow that, you people go through and uh, they draw these cards and you have a hand of cards. So you're doing a little bit of like, I don't know if you really call it like hand management, definitely not set collection. Eh. Anyway. Yeah. You, I guess you're doing hand management of sorts where you have these cards in your hand and you'll play one of them, uh, which basically allows you to put one of your people into a certain building of the city. So you go through and you populate your pieces into these various buildings and the buildings can store anywhere from, you know, like two to four typically uh, people within them. And, As you go through, you start putting your people in there. Uh, There's like a a mini phase change after a certain card is drawn to the or from the deck. And then you have this relatives rule where you can, if you put uh, a person into a building that's occupied, you can put extra people out into uh, a specific building. So this way you seed the board with people a little bit quicker. So after... um, uh, this particular card, another card is drawn from this deck. Uh, it basically goes into essentially like phase two of the game, which is now uh, what I call get everybody out because uh, the volcano is erupting and uh, nobody wants to be in Pompeii. Uh, at this point, the cards are taken out of the game altogether and you now use the tiles that you have in a handy cloth bag. And the tiles have six different symbols on them and you take these tiles out of the bag and you start putting them on uh, different parts of the city. Uh, it's simulating like a lava flow. Um, yeah, you know, like a lava flow or mud flow, whatever you want to call it. That's uh, going through the city. Uh, at this point, what you do is you move your people towards exits in the city. And this works a little bit like Finca. If you're familiar with Finca, what you do is you move your characters around a, uh, like a windmill and the amount of spaces that you move depends on the amount of people that are on your starting space. So if you're on the space with, uh, two other people, you would move three spaces cause there's three people from there. If you're the single person on that space, then you can move one and, and so forth. So you have this kind of mechanism where you're moving, you're trying to move your characters out of the city and uh, you you move your characters and then you draw a tile and then you put essentially lava somewhere in the city. Uh, There's specific places where you can place these things based on what you draw. And uh, this is where the game gets uh, kind of interesting where you're now trying to box people in. You're trying to put lava on top of them, you know, your, your opponents. And uh, one of the funnest aspects of this game is that you have that volcano in the board. And when you uh, cover up somebody with lava, you take them and you chuck them into the volcano. And that is like one of my most favorite parts of this game. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's being mean or whatnot, but I just love throwing people's uh, or play or other players, uh, people into the volcano. It's, it gives me great pleasure. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's not so much fun if it's your guys that are being thrown in there. But, uh, yeah, you just go through up until, uh, everybody is essentially, um, either in the volcano or out of the city. 
and uh, that's the end of the game. So uh, the game is is actually very very simple. Um, you, know, you just put your guys in, and the uh, lava starts flowing, and get your guys out as best as you can. And uh, I was really surprised the first time I played this game is that it's not a huge scoring game. <laughs> you know, it's not one of those where you score like 40, 50 points. Uh, you know, a lot of people will get like points in the single digits. If you did double digits, wow, I think you'd actually did pretty good uh, for the most part. And uh, this game is also on Yukata. Uh, however, uh, I really did not like my experience of playing it on Yukata. I've I've always been saying for quite some time now that certain games are good for Yukata, others are not. This is one of those games that I would say it's it's not the best place to play the game because it doesn't really give you a good representation of the game because it just takes so long to play, and especially if you play a four-player game. If people aren't taking their turns quickly, it'll literally be like one turn every two days and... It's just it's just not a lot of fun. So the Yukata game, although it's extremely well implemented, it's it's not the best way to get a, a taste for the game. So um, I, I think this is a a pretty cool, uh, fun, light game. It's it's not too deep. Um, hardcore gamers will probably be real bored with this game, um, but uh, I, I do love the volcano <laughs> and throwing. Uh, the guys in there um negatives on the game is just some of the quality of the components it's they're not awful but they're not as as good as some of the other games that we've become used to lately especially with some of these kickstarter games that have had you know really top not top notch components so uh i i do enjoy this game i i would recommend it uh if you like to play lighter games uh it actually might be a, a decent gateway or entry style game. However, um, the whole volcano aspect of it might be a little confrontational for some people. So they might not like that too much. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty good family game. So uh, I enjoy this game. Uh, it might be something that's good to play before, you know, you get to the meaty game of, of game night, but uh, yeah, definitely check this out. Um, you know, definitely give it a play uh, in person if you can, um, and, uh, and see if you like it. So then, uh, the last game that I want to talk about is, uh, a game that I also got a review copy of, and, uh, that's Pixel Tactics 2 from Level 99 Games. Uh, this game came out this year in 2013, and it was designed by, uh, Brad Talton Jr. It's a game for two players, uh, plays in about 45 minutes or so, and is for 12 and up. Uh, this is a card game. It's a tactical strategy game, of, uh, of which there's you know, a couple of different games out there on the market uh, that try to accomplish this type of thing. And uh, basically, uh, a quick rundown of what you're looking to do is um, you're you're playing against your opponent. You have a little play area in front of you uh, where you have a leader card. So the leader card is the card that is uh, the main card that you're trying to protect. And uh, you're using all of your other forces to attack your opponent and uh, knock out uh, their leader. And then uh, if you do that, you win the game. And if you don't do that and they do that to you, you lose the game. Straight, uh, straightforward enough, I guess. So components uh, in in this game, uh, well, it's a, it's a card game. So uh, it's got cards. Uh, the quality of the cards is, is pretty nice. Um, the box that it comes in, I, I guess this is my biggest gripe of any of the components in the game is, is the box. It's one of those boxes that are meant to hang from that little hook in the pegboard or whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's, it's not the best, it's not the best way to store the game just because everything kind of just gets shuffled around in there. You wind up putting two decks together side by side. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just not the best way to store it. I'd really recommend, uh, if you get this game, just get a deck box and throw everything in there. Uh, that will, that'll store it and keep the cards, I think in, in much better condition. Um, you do get some counters with it. Uh, the counters punched out. Okay. Uh, they're just little like health, uh, markers. 
And um, uh, another thing that's interesting about the game is the instructions. It's a huge, huge sheet uh, of paper. The thing unfolds and uh, it'll probably take up a, a good portion of your table. All the rules are laid out, out on it uh, really nicely. The game's not all too difficult, so you know they don't have to go through a whole lot to explain the game. But uh, it's explained fairly well, and there's uh, um, a nice QR code on there where you can uh, take a picture of that with your phone or whatnot and uh, just get uh, like a gameplay video. Uh, and uh, that that was that was pretty well done. On the back of that is actually I don't know if you would call it a play mat or, or what, but uh, it basically shows you the layout of of the of the playing field. So you can use the back of the rules and lay it out between you and your opponent. And now you have a nice grid where you lay your cards out, and uh, it shows you where the discard pile is and so forth. So that w- that was kind of neat, but uh, you know this thing will definitely not fit in the deck box if you do that. So you might want to keep it elsewhere. But you only need the cards to play, so uh, I don't know if that's really necessary to keep it in the deck box anyway. So um, the artwork on the game is really nice. It's got since it's got pixel in the name. It's uh, pixelated art. Really reminds me of back in the day, you know, with the old uh, computer systems and video game systems. Uh, it's uh, it's it's really nice art. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, it's well, really well done pixel art. Uh, one thing uh, I did kind of uh, find out was that uh, uh, this game is uh, Pixel Tactics Two, so it's second in the series. There's Pixel Tactics uh, One, essentially. And there's two forms of it. There's one that came in the mini game library by Level 99 Games, and then there's also a standalone. Well, this can be mixed with uh, with the the first version of the game. Uh, however, I did find out that the mini game library has a linen finish on it, uh, the on the cards, and then the standalone has a smooth finish to it. Uh, both in the Pixel Tactics 1 standalone and Pixel Tactics 2. They're both smooth. So if you mix Pixel Tactics 2 with the minigame library, you probably want to sleeve your cards just so you can't tell texture-wise what card's what. I don't know if that's a huge deal or not, but it's just something to be aware of. Okay, um, uh, so uh, moving on real quick. Uh, uh, basically, the game functions or plays where it's a tactical game where each player has 25 cards and the decks are identical uh, between the players and you choose one card as a leader and what's really unique about these cards is they have two orientations so one orientation is the leader so it gives you the leader and their specifics health and attack and so forth and you place this down in front of you, and it's placed in the center of your play area. And think of it as a three by three grid, so it goes right in the middle. And then, when you have the cards in the other orientation, where you just basically like rotate them 180 degrees, those cards now have a, a couple of different um, slots to them. I'll, I'll just call them slots uh, for now, where where you place them in your play field affects what the abilities of that card is. So for example, the, the front part or the, the topmost part of your grid is called the Vanguard. The middle is called the flank and then the, the bottom is called the rear. So there's uh, different colored um, sections of that card that show you if you place, for example, a card in the Vanguard section, it has that ability. If you place it in the rear, it has that ability. If you place it in the flank, it has you know this other ability. So when you're placing these cards to the table, what is really interesting about this game is that it forces you to think not only of my hand of cards that I have, which should I you know put down in front of me, but you're you're also thinking where should I place it, you know. Do I want to place this one in the vanguard, or do you want? Do, I really like this ability that it has when it's in the flank. You know, I, I might want to place it there. So it just adds like a whole new level of um, of like strategy and and like 
thinking to the game that it's really unique and and I really really enjoyed this. And then uh, there also is another uh, ability to the cards uh, where a card can be used as orders, where it's like a one time use and then you discard it. Um, so you, you actually don't play it in the front, not in the front, but you don't play it uh, to your play area. So uh, yeah, that that's really unique to the cards, and I've never seen anything like this in, in any other game, so I was really taken by it. Um, then, uh, yeah, basically what you're looking to do with this is you're placing your cards, you're playing them to the, um, to the grid, essentially, in front of you, the playing area. And uh, you use your cards to attack your opponent. And uh, you can attack them with melee straight across, or you can use a ranged attack where you can attack uh, not necessarily like the front row, but you can attack the back row. And there's various ways to intercept and so forth. And so, you know, you're basically looking to just uh, start whittling away at your opponent uh, up until you get their uh, leader down to zero points. And uh, if you do that, you win. Uh, this game is, was actually such a pleasant surprise because, you know, there's other games out there that are like tactical card games per se, like, you know, Summoner Wars and et cetera. And uh, this one was like such a fresh take on, on uh, you know, tactical card games that, uh, you know, I, I really was excited to try it and I introduced a couple people to it and everybody really, really enjoyed it. Um, everybody took to it fairly quickly. The rules are pretty darn simple. Uh, you know, once once you learn the rules, the game basically becomes like, you know, where do I place my cards? You know, what ability do I want? You you weigh your options, and sometimes it's a real tough choice. And both players have the same decks, so that also creates an interesting uh, situation because you know your player has a similar type of card that they might use on you, or at least you probably at that point hope that they don't use it on you. But, uh, yeah, so uh, a very interesting take, and uh, I actually prefer this to uh, some of the other games that are similar in, uh, in you know, using cards to do that style fighting as opposed to miniatures or whatnot. So, um, you know, th- this game uh, is is very cool. It's an excellent tactical card game, it's very portable, extremely portable. Basically, you've got a little bit over 50 cards total with the two decks. So you can just throw this in a pocket, throw it in a bag, uh, just take it anywhere with you. And it's perfect to play on a lunch break just because it's so easy to play and easy to carry around. Um, the rules are, are very simple, uh, yet even though the rules are very simple, there is a lot of strategy to this game, which is, is a definite plus. Uh, the only negative thing I can really give to this game is that box. And I'm not going to go into that again, but uh, yeah, just the box kind of uh, isn't ideal. Just get a deck box and use that instead. So uh, this game is one that I would uh, definitely recommend uh, to people that, you know, like uh, tactical strategy style games. If you like Summoner Wars, definitely give this thing a shot. It's uh, definitely something that is interesting, new and fresh. Although, uh, I don't know if I can say new, Pixel Pixel Tactics 1 was out for a while. It's just, uh, this is more cards, uh, different characters and so forth. But uh, if you haven't played that, it's it's definitely worth uh, giving this uh, a shot. Um yeah, so that is um, that is uh, Pixel Tactics 2. So that right there uh, kind of concludes the games that I wanted to cover. Uh, it took a lot longer than I had planned. Uh, I guess I'm uh, pretty close here to an hour and a half, so I'm going to try to blast through the remaining part of this uh, real quick. So um, the next part, next thing I want to talk about is Essen. So this is something that... Um, happened uh, in Germany. Uh, the Spiel at Essen, I believe, is what it's called, 2013. And uh, this is where they release pretty much like all the new games. All the, the publishers seem to basically target Essen as where they're going to be releasing their games. So it's 
all their games are coming out or being demoed at this time. And they're coming out probably for the holiday season because the holidays are are shortly uh, starting shortly thereafter. And uh, I had really thought about, I gave a little bit of thought on what I wanted to talk about for uh, the essence segment here. And I originally was thinking about doing kind of like uh, what a lot of the other shows had done where it's like an Essen anticipation or, you know, what was going to be cool at Essen. And there were so many people that did that. I, I thought, you know, I don't think I'll do that. And then I thought about doing a, a segment on what will have, you know, what we saw at Essen and uh, what I'm really looking forward to. And, I kind of scratched that as well. Instead, I I think what I want to talk about is out of all of the hundreds of titles, which are the ones that really interest me the most that, um, you know, really make me want to say something notable about the game or that I is something that I definitely want to buy. Not something that I'm thinking about buying, but just something that I definitely want to buy that I'm going to put my money behind. So, uh, that's what we're going to be doing here. So the first game that I wanted to mention was one that I haven't heard a whole lot about this game uh, outside of at least my interest in the game, and that's uh, a game called Invaders. So this is a game by Mark Chaplin, who also did uh, Revolver, Revolver 1 and 2, actually. So I really enjoyed those games, and they're uh, two-player card games, where people are, you know, basically fighting each other. And uh, I enjoyed those games uh, quite a bit. So, uh, you know, Mark's games are something that I'm definitely interested in and kind of keeping an eye out for. So this is a a card game that is kind of like an evolution of the Revolver series. It probably doesn't really do it justice, but uh, it's got cards and a board. (laughs) And I like cards and boards. Uh, It's got uh, uh, an interesting theme that I really enjoy. And uh, this is uh, one that I'm definitely, definitely interested in in picking up. Uh, The next game that I wanted to mention was, I I guess it's kind of like a no-brainer. This is uh, Caverna by Uwe Rosenberg. And this is, uh, well, I guess I've heard a, a couple of different um, ways to describe this game. A lot of people call it like Agricola 2.0. It, it's basically taking a lot of what people liked in Agricola and stepping it up a notch. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about this game. And, uh, I'm, I'm really, really interested in this game. I mean, this is a, this is one that I'm definitely going to buy. Uh, I would buy basically sight unseen almost, but, uh, it's got kind of a high price point, unfortunately. Uh, it's got a lot of stuff in it, so maybe that justifies the price point. I don't know. I guess maybe that's what we do. We we try to justify these these things as, as best as we can. But uh, Caverna uh, looks so amazing and so interesting. I've heard so many cool reviews on it. It really, really sparked uh, my interest, and again, it's it's a it's kind of like a must buy for me. Uh, another game, uh, Glass Road. Now, this is a, a game that has also gotten a lot of really positive feedback uh, from a lot of other reviewers, and definitely sparked my interest. This is another Uwe Rosenberg game, so uh, I, I'm a big fan of of his games. And, uh, this is, I guess he's, his games are almost to the, to the point for me where I, I'd almost have to, uh, I almost say that I would get the games regardless. And instead of talking myself into buying the games, I almost need to talk myself out of buying the games just because they're almost like an insta buy <laughs> of sorts. So, uh, this is just another one of his games that looks just amazing. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details with these games just because you can get that information elsewhere. But I I just want to basically say like that I'm interested in these things. So glass road, another one that is just kind of like a must buy for me. Another one also is another one of my favorite designers is uh, freedom and freeze. And, uh, there's uh, freezes landlord. Uh, this is a, a card game 
that's uh, being, um, I guess you can call it re-released, as uh, it came out, uh, I don't know how long ago initially, but it's a little bit of a, a change up on this game. It's a interesting card game that, uh, again, is, is a must buy for me. Um, uh, Friedemann's games, not quite the same stature as uh, Uwe's games for me, where I'm a little selective on which of uh, Friedemann's games I'll go after just because some of them quite aren't for me. They're, they're not for my play group. Uh, but uh, the Landlord game is one that uh, definitely sparks my interest and uh, is a must-buy for me. Uh, another game is CV. Um, there's just something about this game that, uh, I don't know, just appeals to me so much. Uh, uh, CV is basically... Um, I guess the European version of a resume, <laughs> which uh, here in the United States, we call them resumes for like, use them for job applications and so forth. So uh, it's, yeah, this, this one has got uh interesting little uh, dice uh, mechanism to it. You've got cards um, and you basically go through and, um, and so I guess, you build, uh, I don't know, your, your resume, you build like a life and, uh, you know, there's all these different possibilities. Uh, the artwork on it is, is pretty cool. Uh, again, I don't think this is a, a really well-known one, but, uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, very appealing to me. Okay. So those are, um, the main games that I want to say are like kind of must haves. I mean, there's, there's a couple others that I might throw on, on that list. Um, uh, they're kind of like on the fence, like that uh, Bremer Haven game, and there's a couple of others. But uh, uh, outside of those, I, I did want to make mention of some that kind of had my attention. Uh, the first was uh, Mush Mush. Uh, this is uh, the latest of the uh, Lamont Brothers uh, or Fragor games. Uh, their latest, like, limited production run game. Um, I, I like snow tails, so this is kind of like snow tails two, uh, as some people called it. But just the cost of the game is just way outside of of like my tastes, I guess. Um, I I really hope that this gets picked up, just like snow tails does, and there's a more affordable um, release of this. But uh, I did want to make mention of it just because it, it seemed interesting. Uh, it seemed like something that I would like, but then again, the cost was just prohibitive. And uh, then Roads and Boats, this is another one that I've been hearing about a lot, but that's another one. It's just so expensive. It's just so expensive that, I mean, it just pushes it way out of uh, me ever getting it just because of, of the price alone. And then one that uh, I was definitely interested in, I'd heard so many good things about it, but it eventually just got put into the, you know, I really got to play this thing before um, before I decide on if I want it or not. And it's Palaces of Carrara. So there, this is a game that's been out for a while, but there's finally an English version coming out. So um, uh, ultimately, I, I think this one might move into the must-have um, eventually when it does, gets, does get released. But at the time being, it's just one that was uh, kind of off on the sidelines. But I thought I would mention it just because uh, I had been tracking it for quite some time. So those are my main Essen titles that I was really interested in. Um, there's a lot of them that I, I do kind of like, but it's not one that I'm, you know, there's there's not too much that I'm really super duper interested in. And uh, one thing that looks great for us here in the United States, at least, is like a lot of the big titles are going to be released here in the U.S. fairly soon. At least that's the plan. So titles will be hitting late November, um, in December, possibly early January. At least a lot of the Z-Man titles supposedly are, and hopefully that uh, holds true and they have enough uh, copies and print and, and so forth. So uh, that was Essen, uh, Essen uh, 2013. There's a lot of coverage on BGG for a lot of videos that the team, the BGG team did a lot of great stuff on there, so if I'm sure you've uh, probably gone through a lot of that info and um, 
you know, perused a lot of the videos, found out tons of info. And, uh, yeah, I'd really be interested also in getting feedback from, uh, from you listeners also as to, uh, what you really thought was cool out of us. And so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, do some feedback uh, on the show on, uh, on the website or in Twitter and let me know what you really came away with as like the big winners and what you're really interested in. I'd love to hear that. Okay. And then, uh, and, oh boy, that's over an hour and a half already. How about that for a short show? Um, then, uh, the next section I want to talk about before we close out the show is just the new segment of the show called 20 shows ago. This should be uh, fairly quick. So uh, going back to episode nine, which was released in episode 2012, we talked about uh, a bunch of things. And uh, we talked about, uh, first thing was, I guess, Ogre. So I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about Ogre. It's a Steve Jackson uh, Kickstarter that uh, was a Kickstarter in 2011 or 2012. I really don't remember at, at this time right now. But uh, it was kickstarted. There's a designer edition, which is just crazy, crazy production. Huge, huge, immense, immense box. Like hundreds of pieces. You get these little tanks that you put together. I mean, just the amount of work that they've spent on this thing is just amazing. It's a limited production. Of Granted, it's going to be a production of, you know, thousands of... Uh, of copies of this thing, but they say they're not going to reprint it. So the designer edition as it is, uh, I believe it kickstarted for a hundred bucks. You know, if you didn't get it uh, and you don't get it anytime soon, you probably won't get it unless it's on the secondary market, you know, resale and so forth. But a lot of people are just drooling over this game. And I think the game was something like what, 25 pounds uh, based on the reports that we've gotten so far. It's already hit Kickstarter uh, backers already. I think they started getting it uh, about a month ago or so. But uh, yeah, so we talked about Ogre, and uh, it's finally, finally starting uh, to get to people now. I mean, this was a year and a half ago. So um, it, it definitely looks like an interesting game. Um, I've never actually played the original Ogre, which I guess cost three bucks. Uh, and it came in a little Ziploc bag. Uh, oh, I did read that uh, they are publishing a reprint of that. So you will get uh, like the little cheapy version of Ogre available in 2014. So they'll probably just uh, keep the designer edition uh, done uh, as is and not reprint it, but people can buy the original one uh, and enjoy it like they did in the past, or maybe it'll be a new experience for them. But uh, yeah, so Ogre uh, is finally uh, uh, hitting people's homes, and uh, I'm really looking forward to um, seeing what people's takes on it are and and such. Um, We also talked about Thunderstone Advance. This is um, the kind of like Thunderstone 2.0 or 1.5, as some people called it. So it's a remaking of Thunderstone. They've changed the rules around to make it a little more... I guess, accessible or work better with people. Um, this was something that I was really interested in back then, and I've really kind of lost interest in uh, Thunderstone, uh, particularly like within the last year or so. I don't know, I'm just kind of like maybe getting out of the whole deck building thing. Cause, uh, I was really strong into Dominion, Ascension, uh, Thunderstone, and so forth uh, back in the day. But, you know, just kind of getting old maybe a little bit. So, uh, yeah, Thunderstone uh, is something that I just, uh, I guess, don't care too much for anymore, and I haven't been interested in any of the the follow-up releases for this either. Um, in that game, I, I did, and I'm sorry, in that episode, I also did talk about uh, focus groups. Uh, just do a quick reminder of that in case you haven't heard that episode. So uh, in that episode, I talked about how... Um, I had kind of uh, learned about focus groups and I thought it was a fantastic way of earning some extra money for, you know, buying board games where focus groups, essentially uh, you go and you meet up uh, as a panel and uh, you know, you just speak your mind on products and, and so forth. And, you know, you'll get anywhere from like 50 on up to, you know, a couple hundred bucks, depending on what you're doing. So it's easy money. I don't say easy money, but 
it uh it's a it's a really interesting way to get some extra cash and uh so it's something that I still do occasionally and uh I'd still recommend it definitely check it out uh you know google it to see what's available in in your local area uh we also talked about uh a couple of the uh, uh easy play line of games uh in particular uh Numeri and Finito and uh these are ones that I, I still enjoy occasionally finito is now available in uh electronic form on uh oh what was that website called oh yes it's called uh happy meeple so it's out on happy meeple so you can play it online and it's a really good implementation of it and uh numeri is uh it's a, it's a pretty darn cool game it's one that i've actually played with uh my son uh, he's five, and I think we first introduced it to him when he was four. So he was able to get some basic gameplay with with that game. You know, he doesn't know all the rules and how to score and everything, but it's it's a really fun little family game. Uh, I definitely uh, recommend those uh, both as well. So uh, I'm definitely year and a half later, I still like both of those games. Also talked about Zularetto, the dice game. Also, back then we called it Zularetto Werfelspiel because there was only a German version of the game. So it's uh, it's kind of like the dice, uh, the light dice version of Zularetto slash Coloretto. And uh, it's an enjoyable game. Um, kind of uh, lost a little bit of interest in that game, but I'll, I'll still play it occasionally, but it's definitely not my go-to game. And so Zularetto the Dice Game, uh, definitely a, a decent game. Uh, then we talked about Lords of Waterdeep. I believe at that time this was a fairly new game, and this game's been out for a while, and it's got uh, you know a pretty good standing as a as a pretty decent uh, like worker placement entry level game. Uh, there's the uh, what was it called uh, Scoundrels at Skullport expansion that came out um, right around Gen Con of this year, 2013. So that's August 2013. The expansion came out and kind of you know, one up the game a little bit, made it a little more interesting, gave it some more variations. Uh, Lords of Waterdeep uh, is still, uh, you know, uh, a pretty well-regarded game, at least in my eyes. It's it's decent uh, for what it is. Okay, so that was a quick look at uh, 20 shows ago. or Yeah, 20 shows ago, the, the games that we talked about in episode 9. And uh, so let's uh, kind of take the episode out a little bit over here. So I want to mention a quick uh, thing here for the game list section that uh, I try to do every episode. These are just things that I'm looking forward to uh, at this particular moment. Uh, Number one is the Manhattan Project app. This is a a thing that's out on Kickstarter right now. So looking to get Manhattan Project, uh, which is one of my favorite games um, fantastic, fantastic game by Minion Games. Uh, it's uh, there's a Kickstarter right now to bring it to a couple of different platforms: uh, Android, iOS, PC. This is a fantastic game. I think believe you can back it for only ten bucks. Um, I was I definitely got in on this one uh, early on. Is immediately when I found out about it, I was like Insta Pledge. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. Although I'm sure it's probably going to be a little ways off. Uh, then also Invaders, I uh, talked about that one a little bit ago. I, I loved uh, Revolver 1 and 2, and I'm definitely, definitely interested in seeing what the uh, uh, designer, uh, Mark Chaplin, has uh, in store for this one. And uh, definitely on the game list section here, Caverna by Uwe. I just got to get this one. I'm really, really stoked for this one. So uh, it's a pretty small game list section over here. And uh, so that's that. And then we'll take it uh, into the final thoughts of the games, the five games that I talked about. Uh, First one is Amerigo. Again, uh, I I love the production. I love the dice tower, not dice tower, the the cube tower that the game comes with. Um, I'm sort of uncertain on the staying power, if it's going to last. You know, there's some other Feld games that, you can go to time and again, like I really like Castles of Burgundy and a couple of his other games. I, I just don't know if this one will, you know, maintain the stature that it's got right now. Um, but uh, otherwise, the, the fun's game, the game's pretty fun. 
and it I really like the nostalgia aspect, at least for me, because it reminds me of Seven Seas of Gold, Tetris, and Peloponnese uh, all together there. Castaways, the second game that I talked about, it's an amazing thematic game. I really, really uh, enjoyed this game. I, I love how it just puts you into that setting of being in the shipwreck. However, uh, it, it does play a little bit long, so you just have to be prepared for it. Uh, the group has to be ready for it. The more players you have, the longer it'll take. I think the game will start at about two hours. Um, I don't know if it can be played any quicker than that. But uh, at least when you play it, the game, since it it engages you quite a bit and it involves you in the theme and so forth, it goes by, uh, and it seems like it goes by pretty quickly. And again, it is pretty hard. It it is a difficult game to win. Um, Just getting off the island itself is is pretty challenging. The next game uh, that I talked about is Infection, Humanity's Last Gasp. This is a a top-notch solo game. Uh, I really love what John Gibson did with this game. I love the puzzle aspect. And uh, uh, again, it's another challenging game. So, you know, it it makes you work for that victory. That's for sure. And I'm really excited to see an expansion come out. So I I hope uh, uh, John does uh, come through with that. The next one I talked about was Downfall of Pompeii by Mayfair Games. Uh, this one is, it's a fun, light game. Uh, definitely play this one in person, uh, rather than Yukata to try to learn what the game's all about. And, uh, I love the volcano chucking where you, you basically take the other players pieces and you just toss them into the volcano. It's just uh, a whole lot of fun. And I don't know, it's, uh, my, my favorite part of the game. And then, uh, lastly, there's uh pixel tactics too. This is a fantastic tactical card game, very portable. Uh, it's perfect to take anywhere the you know to work, plan your lunch break, the mall, who knows where. Uh, it's a school. You can play just about anywhere. You just need a little bit of table space. It's got a fair amount of strategy to it, and I love the um, the uh, aspect of it where you rotate the cards, they have different functions and where you place them on the on the player field in front of you, they have different abilities. That is very cool. And I also like the art. I love the pixel art. They did a really top-notch job with it. So that's it for the closing thoughts or the final thoughts. Um, let me just uh, wrap up the game over here since we're approaching almost two hours. I mean, to wrap up the, the show here since we're approaching uh, almost two hours. And again, uh, this is going to be an unedited show, so you're going to get the raw, raw action over here. It's just uh, all the little flubs and so forth, and you got them here. And uh, we had a couple instances here where uh, my son's not feeling too well, so I had to go up and and uh, kind of comfort him and, and so forth, give him some medicine and so forth. So hopefully it wasn't too obvious. So if you heard some um, not the best continuity in what I was saying, that's because... Uh, in, in the probably mid sentence there, I actually went upstairs and I paused it. And the recording went upstairs, gave medicine, and came back like twenty minutes later. Then tried to remember where I was without stopping the recording. So, anyway, it is what it is. So, uh, hope you enjoyed the show. Just want to make mention. Uh, please uh, follow this board game life on Twitter. Our uh, our name is T Board Game Life, so that's at T Board Game Life. That's T, not this, the letter T. And uh, we also have a guild on BGG. Join the guild and uh, definitely check out the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the channel and uh, you can see the video reviews that I do. Um, also, uh, looking forward to any feedback on the show. Uh, if you like uh, the format, uh, definitely looking to make the episodes a little bit shorter. Uh, going forward, try to keep them around an hour. But, uh, hey, it looks like I just start talking about this stuff and uh, I can't stop. So, uh, hey, that concludes episode number 29 of uh, This Board Game Life. I uh, hope you enjoyed the show and uh, catch you all next time.